plant in the pathogenesis of the disease. They're willing to identify abnormalities of lipid and energy metabolism in their vegetation and their contribution to the local so loss of vision and to find and test novel treatments uh, for the diabetic retinopathy. So Ridwick published uh, his research in many journals, such as Neurons, Journal of Neuroscience, PNAS, Journal of Lipid Research, Neurobiology of Disease, among many others. He presented it in many national and international meetings. And he was supported by various grants, including uh, from NIH and private foundations. So with that, for our distinguished speaker series, please welcome Dr. Ritwik Rajagopal. And the title of his presentation today is Effects of Light Deprivation and Visual Cycle Inhibition on Bioenergetic Signaling in the Diabetic Brain. Well, uh, thank you, Sasha, uh, for that kind in, uh, introduction. And thank you to Vladimir. Uh, for the invitation. I got to say, um, uh, we miss you both very much uh, here in St. Louis. But seeing that uh, we still have about a foot of snow on the ground, I think you probably made the right decision uh, moving over to the West Coast. All right. So today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some work in progress from my lab. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, on mostly uh, unpublished data. Uh, so I welcome any feedback. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm uh, a clinician. Uh, I'm a retina surgeon. I see a lot of patients with uh, vision loss from diabetic retinopathy. And here uh, is an example of a patient who um, has very end stage uh, diabetic retinopathy. This would probably be the kind of patient that is currently being uh, presented at Phil Rosenfeld's uh, meeting there uh, uh, at the angiogenesis meeting. But I like this slide because it shows all of the bad features that diabetes can cause to a retina. And uh, what you'll appreciate from the slide is that the features are predominantly vascular. Uh, and uh, this disease in all of its visible stages are, uh, is, a, is a vascular disease. And therefore, quite understandably, mechanistic thinking about the pathogenesis of the of the disease has focused on vascular uh, uh, biology. Uh, you know, evidence uh, uh, proof that that's uh, correct uh, is that uh, angiostatic medicines like the anti-VEGF agents that we use for this disease are very effective. Uh, in fact, for some patients, they're nothing short of miraculous. But um, that said, I think it's very important to note that uh, even these very, uh, very good modern therapies have important limitations. Uh, across the studies that uh, look at these agents, there are about a third of patients that don't respond uh, to uh, anti-VEGF monotherapy. Uh, added to that, we have just an increasing prevalence of diabetes. This is primarily driven by the um, uh, pandemic of obesity around the world. Uh, and therefore, there is also an increasing prevalence of diabetic retinopathy. So um, uh, with that said, there are needs for um, uh, adjunctive medicines. And therefore, several of us in the field ask a very basic question, which is what cells really are affected early on as in this disease? Uh, and so um, you know, I'd like to focus on photoreceptors. Your uh, audience really does not need much of an introduction to this. Uh, Dr. Kern has been uh, you know, a pioneer of uh, uh, convincing us that photoreceptors are in fact an early target of diabetic retinopathy. Um, but I'll focus on some clinical uh, uh, pieces of evidence. And I think that the sum of the clinical evidence can be boiled down to uh, three findings, which is number one, uh, electroretinographic changes in diabetes, which occur and have been known to um, occur for you know, uh, over 70 years now, uh, many of these changes do localize to the outer retina. Number two, one of the largest um, uh, 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 studies looking at protective factors in the diabetic retina uh, showed that um, people who have who are relatively protected from end stages of diabetic retinopathy have elevated levels of retinol binding protein three. And this was the medalist trial that was done out of the Joslin Diabetes Institute. And then number three, uh, patients who have coexistent 
uh, ret uh, retinitis pigmentosa and diabetes show very low rates of diabetic retinopathy, much lower than one would expect. Um, despite the fact that they have, they often have very severe diabetes and have uh, very severe uh, other comp microvascular complications of diabetes, including nephropathy and neuropathy. So, um, you know, uh, that's a curious inverse relationship. Uh, Jeffrey Arden first showed this or reported this 20 years ago. Uh, and the mechanism of this protection is presumed to be um, a reduced oxygen demand of the neural retina um, due to the retinal degeneration. And so I'm, I'm demonstrating this in these two images of patients of mine, one of which has uh, retinitis pigmentosa and diabetes. You'll notice that this particular patient with 40 years of exposure of di to diabetes has really none of the stigmata of diabetic retinopathy, although it's showing plenty of the peripheral degeneration you'd expect from retinitis pigmentosa. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a patient who I've treated with a very tried and true um, therapy for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is peripheral uh, laser-based ablation of the neural retina. And you can see in this visual that they're quite similar. It's that they're you're reducing the oxygen demand uh, due to you know, reduced amount of neural tissue. And so um, you know, that seems like a reasonable mechanism. However, um, there are some paradoxical findings that make us question that particular mechanism. And that, those findings are uh, mainly that non-degenerative loss of rod phototransduction is also associated with reduced um, severity of diabetic retinopathy. And I will point out the caveat that this particular, uh, these particular findings are limited to mouse models currently. I don't know of any um, uh, human studies that have uh, corroborated this. But with that caveat, we know that transducin-1 knockout mice are protected from diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Kern's lab showed this um, first. Uh, uh, our lab uh, uh, collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Kefalov uh, also showed this. We published this um, a couple of years ago. Uh, we also went on to show that another non-degenerative um, uh, uh, mouse model of outer retinal degeneration, the RP65 nulls are protected from diabetic retinopathy. Um, uh, the UCI group uh, uh, there showed that visual cycle inhibition reduces severity of diabetic retinopathy. And our group showed that prolonged uh, light deprivation also protects against diabetic retinopathy. Now, these, all of these results are somewhat paradoxical considering the previous slide, because um, at least at face value, every one of these interventions would be expected to increase ATPs uh, in the retina and therefore increase metabolic demand. So how is it that these interventions could ameliorate uh, diabetic retinopathy. Let's focus on that paradox. The reason why we find these results paradoxical is that it rests on um, a basic assumption. And that assumption is that the initial insult in diabetic retinopathy is a vascular one, that, that the retina is somewhat starved in diabetes because of compromised blood flow. And therefore, um, you know, strategies to repair blood flow could be therapeutic, and we know that's the case. But also, one would assume that strategies to reduce metabolic demand and therefore reduce the starvation would be expected to um, uh, ameliorate diabetic retinopathy. And therein lies the paradox. I'll say that that latter part, looking at reducing metabolic demand in the, in the retina in, in clinical settings, has not proven to be very effective. And there's been now several studies that show that. So therefore, our group wanted to address this particular assumption. And uh, we chose the approach of testing it by looking at um, intrinsic cellular fuel sensors in diabetes. So I wanna focus on this very um, central uh, metabolic axis that is contained in nearly all mammalian cells. And that is controlled by the uh, master kinase known as uh, adenosine monophosphate activated kinase, the AMP kinase. Uh, in conditions of nutrient deprivation, we have a relative increase in the AMP ATP ratio. This enzyme is directly responsive to that ratio and becomes 
phosphorylated in response to the elevated AMP ATP ratio. Phosphorylation of AMP kinase is an activating event. This kinase becomes active and acts on several targets, one of the principal ones being acetyl-CoA carboxylase, or ACC. Uh, ACC, when phosphorylated by AMP kinase, becomes inhibited. Inhib inhibition, therefore, is in inactivating, uh, and uh, uh, the enzyme catalyzes the carboxylation of the uh, two-carbon species uh, acetyl-CoA to the three-carbon species malonyl-CoA. Uh, and so uh, inhibition of the enzyme re re results in accumulation of acetyl-CoA and depletion of malonyl-CoA. Malonyl-CoA, um, uh, in turn, is a potent in, uh, uh, activator, I'm sorry, the, the potent inhibitor of um, fatty acid oxidation. And therefore, in the absence of malonyl-CoA, we have a promotion of catabolic activity in this case um, uh, by uh, promoting fatty acid oxidation. As you can imagine, this would be very important in tissues like adipose, where um, you know, or, uh, nutrient deprivation of the organ, organism uh, could be uh, 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 you know, remedied by breaking down fuel store, such as in, in uh, triglycerides. Uh, on the contrary, malonyl-CoA serves as a uh, requisite cofactor for biosynthetic uh, processes, such as lipid synthesis. And there are, therefore, in the absence of malonyl-CoA, uh, key enzymes such as fat, fatty acid synthase are inhibited. In, contra in contrast, in settings of nutrient excess, such as in the case maybe with diabetes and with excess sugar, um, there is a decrease in the AMP ATP ratio. Uh, we have dephosphorylation of AMP kinase and inactivation of its activity. Therefore, derepression of, of acetyl CoA carboxylase and activation of this anabolic lipid synthetic pathway. When we examine this, biochemically in the retina, in diabetes, we find unequivocally that across models of diabetes, the diabetic retina, even in very early stages of diabetes, is associated with a marked hypophosphorylation of AMP kinase. Uh, and therefore, this is an, a relative inactivity of AMP kinase. Consistent with this, acetyl-CoA carboxylase is also hypophosphorylated. Uh, and other uh, biosynthetic enzymes are activated, in this case, by phosphorylation, specifically enzymes such as uh, 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 PS6 and P7DS6 kinase. So collectively, these results suggest that a feature of early diabetes in the retina is grossly elevated anabolic signaling. And these findings are not unexpected. In fact, they've been observed before by other groups um, in the past. So what about um, uh, enzyme activity, not just uh, looking at Western blots here. We uh, examined fatty acid synthase activity by an in vitro assay looking at uh, retinal lysates. In this case, we took labeled precursor, added it to retinal lysates, and then um, measured the formation of labeled palmitate, the reaction product, um, uh, afterwards. When we do this, we find that, again, across different models of uh, uh, diabetes, and let me just say for those who don't study diabetes uh, or regularly, that we are using high-fat diet-induced diabetes, that's HFD, that's a model of type 2 diabetes, a DBDB model of diabetes in which leptin receptors are um, uh, lacking function, and therefore these animals overeat and become obese. Both of these models are obesity um, uh, uh, associated models, and therefore they are um, similar to human type 2 diabetes. We also use the very commonly uh, uh, used uh, model of strep induced diabetes, where we knock out uh, pancreatic beta cells. But the point is that across all these models of type 1 and type 2, we are seeing between a 50 and 70 percent increase in enzyme activity. Uh, uh, in respect to, uh, with respect to lipid biosynthesis. These results are, we can recapitulate in vitro using elevated glucose alone. So we believe that this phenomenon of elevated lipid anabolism in the diabetic retina is purely driven by excess glucose. 
So fine, elevated uh, lipid activity might occur in the diabetic retina. Is this um, an association or is this somehow causative to pathology? And to address that particular question, um, we looked at um, uh, uh, mice that had uh, alleles of um, uh, engineered alleles of fatty acid synthase. Again, the uh, rate limiting enzyme in biosynthesis, lipid biosynthesis. So we had loss of function alleles and gain of function alleles. These are published data. So to make a long story short, we find that, um, uh, that uh, loss of function uh, in uh, uh, the retina uh, for fatty acid synthase can be an almost entirely recapitulated by uh, targeted loss in rods, uh, as shown in this, particular, in this first uh, panel. Um, that loss, genetic loss of uh, fatty acid synthase is correlated to reduction in fatty acid synthase activity. And so in the setting of diabetes, uh, FAS loss of function mice have uh, levels of fatty acid synthase activity that are on par with controls and are markedly reduced from their control um, uh, wild type diabetic counterparts. In contrast, <coughs> we have a point mutation um, mild, uh, transgenic mouse that has elevated uh, fatty acid synthase activity in the retina on par with um, uh, uh, wild type diabetic animals. These mice, um, uh, when we uh, look at diabetic retinopathy, the loss of function mice are protected from diabetic retinopathy. We showed this looking at a, a commonly used outcome, which is oscillatory potential delay. And so uh, in these traces, we are uh, looking at filtered oscillatory potentials. The solid lines are the non-diabetic controls. On the top panel, you can see that the dotted uh, line, which represents the control diabetic animal, well, it shows a, a characteristic delay in uh, oscillatory potential responses. That characteristic delay is not seen uh, in diabetic animals that have rod loss of function in fatty acid synthase. We found uh, a, that uh, when we look at uh, expression of reactive uh, genes in the diabetic retina, uh, in the diabetic retina, that fatty acid synthase loss in rods also protects against this particular outcome. Uh, in the sake of time, I will also just mention that uh, the gain of function mouse showed increased susceptibility to diabetic retinopathy with regard to these outcomes. So we, we found and we published that loss of function of the fatty acid anabolic axis protects against diabetic retinopathy and that gain of function uh, exacerbates it. And therefore, we think that this is a key pathologic um, uh, uh, pathway. So how can we intervene? And here's where we get into the, the uh, uh, unpublished work. Um, well, you know, uh, metformin has been known for a long time to activate uh, AMP kinase. And, uh, you know, the, it probably does so indirectly. But um, a couple of years ago, Ashe Butwadeker's group uh, showed that metformin treatment in uh, diabetic DB mice um, uh, uh, is associated with improved phosphorylation of AMP kinase and therefore presumably increased AM AMP kinase activity. Uh, in, on top of that, he showed that metformin treatment corrects uh, visual function abnormalities in these uh, diabetic mice and that metformin corrects um, uh, biochemical abnormalities at uh, 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 potassium channels. He also showed that the effects of metformin were dependent on the expression of AMP kinase. What we did was we took metformin and we treated diabetic mice, similar to what he had done uh, for a couple of weeks and just looked at fatty acid synthase activity. And in, in fact, we found consistent with this pathway that metformin uh, treatment in DB mice was able to reduce uh, uh, fatty acid synthetic activity back to control levels in DB mice. Now, taking it um, briefly away from the pharmacolo pharmacology and back to the um, physiology of the retina in the light versus the dark, uh, well, it's been known for some time that, uh, that uh, uh, the retina is more metabolically active uh, in the dark. And uh, by that, what I mean specifically is that um, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen uh, is higher in the retina during periods of light adaptation, whereas it's lower in dark adaptation as shown in uh, 
uh, by Lindsen Myers group several years ago, uh, you know, consistent with this, uh, Gordon Fain's lab published uh, this um, uh, computational study uh, in current biology many years ago, uh, showing that the eight, uh, predicted AD, ATP usage of the retina in the dark uh, is something like 350% of that in the light. Um, and uh, this is predominantly driven by uh, ATP dependent cation channels. Uh, and so, you know, we presume then that in the dark, uh, because of this increased ATP expenditure at these low light levels, that we would expect that the uh, 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 photoreceptor cytosols will have increased AMP to ATP ratio. So what does this do to uh, these fuel sensor? Well, not, unexpected, uh, un not unexpectedly, um, AMP kinase is uh, robustly phosphorylated in dark adapted retinas compared to light adapted retinas. And in, he, in this experiment, we just took normal adult uh, wild type C57 uh, animals and then put them in the dark for two weeks uh, and uh, 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 interrogated their, their uh, uh, phosphorylation of AMP kinase by Western blot from the retinal lysates. We showed, um, again, in that paper I referenced uh, in conjunction with uh, 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 Vladimir's lab, that uh, if you take diabetic animals um, that are adults and they've had diabetes for five months, at which point they have very severe metabolic disease, and then put these um, animals in uh, dark housing for a one month period of time, that that one, one, one month period of uh, intervention was sufficient to reduce diabetic retinopathy as assessed by normalization of the oscillatory potentials, as well as uh, uh, reduced um, uh, levels of inner retinal apoptosis. When we look at um, the effect of dark on phosphorylation of AMP kinase in diabetes, we find that the hypophosphorylation of, uh, phosphor of AMP kinase in the light in diabetes is completely corrected by a uh, two week period of a dark, um, prolonged dark adaptation. And this is quantified over here on the right. And I wanna now uh, move on to this very important study that uh, uh, your group published um, uh, several years ago, uh, showing that visual cycle inhibition using in this case retinyl amine um, prevented di uh, capillary atrophy, in this case, a strep induced model of diabetes. Uh, this was an eight month period of treatment uh, of visual cycle inhibition uh, and looking at either capillary degeneration or uh, reactive gene expression, uh, this intervention was protected. Uh, well, we decided to look at this in terms of the metabolic signaling. And so we took DB animals, again, adult DB animals uh, at about four months of age um, uh, we planned on doing eight week injections. This was uh, once a week uh, treatments uh, intraperitoneally at the same dose as you had used in that JBC paper. Um, as a pilot experiment, we did a two week short therapy uh, in which we uh, uh, looked at the dark adapted ERG. And you can see that the retinal amine, even after two weeks of therapy, had a very uh, robust effect on the dark adapted ERG. Uh, in that period of time, this is again only two weeks of treatment, uh, we see that uh, in contrast to the uh, vehicle treated DB animals, which show hypophosphorylation of AMP kinase and acetyl-CoA carboxylase, that retinylamine actually corrects both of those um, uh, abnormalities. And I think this is quite a striking finding actually. Uh, consistent with this finding, we also sh uh, show that um, uh, uh, fatty acid synthase activity is inhibited by retinyl amine, uh, as you would be as you would expect based on that AMP kinase result. Uh, and now, what we are doing is we want to know whether retinyl amine treatment in fatty acid synthase uh, gain of function mice has an effect. We would predict that it would not um, if this mechanism is correct. And we are currently in progress doing that study. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have results of that soon. So uh, that's where I wanna end the data. In summary, uh, we find that in diabetes, there is um, a marked suppression of AMP kinase signaling across models, that this is consistent with um, uh, uh, elevated anabolic signaling, specifically through fatty acid biosynthesis, 
and that this may result in lipid associated pathology. We're trying to determine the mechanisms now. Um, light deprivation, metformin, or visual cycle inhibition, we propose, corrects uh, diabetic retinopathy by acting primarily on this uh, bioenergetic pathway. And therefore, I want to compare this to uh, uh, taking a, 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 a retina that is um, uh, overly uh, saturated in glucose and fuel and allowing it to, in a sense, go on a treadmill. And so you know, forcing it into elevated ATP utilization, either with any of these um, interventions, we think is beneficial. And so how do we reconcile all of these different um, pieces of data, especially with the uh, uh, findings of the um, uh, degenerative models of, of RP and the non-degenerative um, models of RP? Well, you know, I think that we should think of diabetic retinopathy really as minimum as a two-phase disease process. And I'm going to borrow a term that I love that, uh, that I saw from a paper of uh, Dr. Kearns, which is this idea of a prodromal threat phase. And this is one in which no visible diabetic retinopathy is present. But we think that this prodromal phase of diabetic retinopathy is primarily characterized by abnormal photoreceptor metabolism and specifically increased anabolic demand. Whereas in later phases, there's where we get the vascular loss and the progressive ischemia. All of our modern therapies are directed at the second phase, rightfully. But connecting these two phases, I think, is an abnormal neurovascular coupling response, which we know occurs in diabetic retinopathy. I'd like to propose the hypothesis that this abnormal neurovascular coupling is actually a direct consequence of the abnormal um, photoreceptor um, metabolism pathways that I've outlined for you today. And we are hoping to um, uh, uh, conduct studies to test that hypothesis, but I also welcome anyone who is interested in this topic to join in that particular line of investigation. Um, so in summary, this is our, our, our um, uh, uh, model of uh, what we think is going on, that elevated AMP kinase activity drives fatty acid synthesis and uh, abnormal anabolism leading to uh, 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 pathology and that uh, perhaps um, you know, non-pharmacologic in, uh, 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 interventions such as light deprivation no, that's not really a very feasible uh, intervention or novel pharmacotherapy directed at this pathway could be therapeutic. And I'd like to thank my collaborators, specifically Vladimir and Sasha for all their help throughout the years. We miss you very much, as I said, March and Golchak at, at uh, Case Western for the uh, collaborating with us on the retinilamine uh, and all of our collaborators here at Washington University. I'm sorry I went a little bit over and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful and very, very clear. So thank you for that. Uh, any questions from uh, room or audience? Eric, that was a beautiful talk. Uh, thank you so much. I, I was intrigued by your result that fatty acid synthase seems to be limited to the rod photoreceptors. And uh, uh, my question is, obviously in the mouse, there are very few calls, but uh, thinking about the humans, for thinking forward about the human retina, do you think that there might be difference in which rods and cones uh, metabolism affect the, the susceptibility to diabetic retinopathy in the foveal versus peripheral retina? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't have any data on that. And it's primarily because we have not yet generated cone-specific um, fatty acid synthase knockout. But I think that you are absolutely correct that in human retina, this would be more of a concern. Um, you know, all the clinicians out there know that especially some features of diabetic retinopathy are very uh, concentrated to the macula, for example, diabetic macular edema. Um, you know, why is it the case that uh, that, that that's, uh, it is macular edema, not just retinal edema generally? Why is that the case? And perhaps cone uh, dysmetabolism might be, um, you know, a feature there. So I think it's a very good point, and we don't have any data to address it at this point. Thank you. John, we have a second speaker, so we will limit to uh, two more questions, maybe. If there is nobody from the web, then we'll go to John and then Sam, and we will conclude this to a second speaker.
Hello, Dr. Raja Gopal. Uh, I think, thank you so much for this presentation. I was uh, wondering uh, in the two phase, in the two phase uh, model that you just uh, highlighted of the metabolic changes followed by the vascular changes, uh, where do you see the osmotic changes sort of um, in this, in this occurring in this two phase model? Is, is the, uh, are the osmotic changes that occur osmolytic changes that occur with the chronically high glucose levels, are the osmotic changes also affecting the metabolic changes or is that, or are the metabolic changes in tandem with the osmotic changes or are the osmotic changes affecting also the vasculature and where, where that sort of plays in, ties in? You know, I, I will confess that I, I, I don't know much about what is going on with the osmotic changes. Besides this, I will tell you that I don't think that any of the pathways that I have outlined for you uh, today um, have, uh, have been impacted by osmo osmolarity due to hypoglycemia. And the reason why I can be relatively confident about that is that in our explant experiments, when we look at these pathways, um, with um, hyperglycemia on the order of 20 to 25 millimolar. Well, we can use a mix of um, L and D glucose to maintain the osmolarity. Uh, and it really only when we have elevated D glucose alone that um, you get these changes. Elevated L glucose by itself has no impact on um, reduction of um, phosphorylation of AMP kinase or um, fatty acid synthase. So I, I, I hope that gives you some insight into at least this particular pathway. I'm not saying that there are not effects of osmolarity due to hyperglycemia in the diabetic retina, but I don't think that they impact these particular pathways. Uh, thank you for the really interesting talk. Um, do you think that uh, fatty acid synthase and AMP kinase are regulated merely at the protein level, or is there a transcriptional response as well? Yeah, a great question. Uh, we looked at this. We looked at this uh, by, um, uh, at least at the level of, of mRNA expression um, and uh, protein expression, and we published this. Uh, we don't see any uh, observable changes in, in either mRNA or protein expression. We believe that this is purely a post-translational change. And I will say that, um, and we're investigating that right now. I think that palmitylation has some, Part of it is part of the answer, by the way. <clears throat> I'll say that I think that's consistent with a lot of the um, uh, attempted GWAS studies of diabetic retinopathy. And you'll probably know that uh, in contrast to other human macular diseases, for example, macular degeneration, there is not a smoking gun locus. And multiple GWAS have been attempted. There is no smoking gun G, uh, locus in diabetic retinopathy. You know, NOx3, I think, is, is the, the, the best uh, uh, potential. And even then, the odds ratio was very poor compared to what we see in other human diseases. So I don't think that this is a disease of gene expression. I think this is a, g a disease of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, metabolic flux in the retina. Thank you very much. Again, wonderful presentation. Thank you all. Uh, good morning once again, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Shinya Sata, whom I know for a long time from uh, as a member, since he has been a member uh, in Vladimir's lab. So Dr. Sata received his PhD from Osaka University in Japan in 2014 where he attended a graduate school of science under the supervision of Professor Satoru Kawamura. He then joined Dr. Vladimir Kefalov lab in Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in Washington University in St. Louis as a postdoc for three years of very productive research. His main focus in both Kawamura and Vladimir lab was the process of visual pigment regeneration in comfort receptors, of course, known as the visual cycle. Uh, and more specifically, the mechanisms of oxidation of 11 c retinol in conalta segments. He published several important contributions on that and few other topics. In 2017, he moved back to Japan and went to Kyoto University, 
where he became an assistant professor and doctor uh, Mitsuyuki Matsuda's lab. They developed a great technique of uh, genetically encoded fluorescent biosensors for two-photon live imaging of protein kinase A in isolated mouse retina and a detection of light-induced regulation of protein kinase A activity in rodents and its role in their dark adaptation. That would be the topic of his presentation today. Since last year, Dr. Sata holds a position of a laboratory chief at the National Cerebral and Cardiovascular Center in Osaka, in Japan. There he continues his research and also helps to establish a new imaging core with seven different state-of-the-art microscopes. Shinya published his work in many great journals, such as Journal of Neuroscience, PNAS, JBC, and Journal of Physiology, to name a few, and also presented his work at national and international conferences. He received a support from several Japanese funding agencies. So please welcome Dr. Shinya Sato, and the title of his presentation today is Ex vivo Imaging of Protein Kinase A Activity with Pikachu. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Sasha. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, people. I'm Shinya Sato talking from Japan. It's 2 a.m. midnight here. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm working here in National Cerebral and Cardiovascular Center. But my talk is about my work of four years in my former workplace, Kyoto University. The, the overall story is that after two, point, two and a half year postdoc training in Vladimir Kefalov's lab, I started a completely new project of two photon live imaging of the retina. And I happened to find that PK activity in the retina is activated by light and tried to understand how and why this happens. This is the outline today. I will use first four slides to explain Pikachu. The second part of this talk is the main body, PK activity imaging data that I published in PNS paper two years ago, October. And the final section is to address the white part of the question, the role of PKA in rod photoreceptor cell. About Pikachu. Pikachu is a fluorescent transgenic mouse expressing this sort of fluorescent protein called a flat biosensor. The sensor is composed of two fluorophores, CFP and YFP, that are connected with linker containing kinase substrate domain and phosphopeptide binding domain. This substrate domain is very important for function. It is designed to be specific, specific for certain kind of kinase, in my case, PKA, and phosphorylation of this domain leads to the conformational change to increase the efficiency of terrestrial resonance energy transfer flat to change the fluorescent color from cyan to yellow. So conveniently, this protein can change the information of phosphorylation into color change that can be detected under fluorescent microscope. This video is a good usage of the flat biosensor designed for arc map kinase. They image the arc activity from small intestine from living mouse directly. And these are videos of nuclei of cells. And they found actually arc activity is blinking at single cell level. This kind of high spatial temporal information cannot be obtained with conventional immunostaining, immunohistochemistry kind of approaches. So imaging is important for analyzing this kind of events. Let me talk about the history of flat biosensor. This picture is my former supervisor, Dr. Michiyuki Matsuda, who started his Pokemon project back in 1998. He wanted to visualize two important signal transduction events, phosphorylation and granny nucleotide exchange reactions. For this purpose, he created many flat biosensors and some of them are named from famous Pokemon names. Indeed, his lab is located in middle school of Kyoto University that's only five miles away from Nintendo head office. So if you get a chance to visit Kyoto, this place is one place I recommend to you if you love video games. I think this is, has been already a, one of the historical places in Kyoto. Back in the story, 
after using these flat bar sensor for in vitro culture cell system, he wanted to visualize application in vivo and started a strong collaboration with this guy, Dr. Kenta Sumiyama from became His highly efficient transgenesis method enabled the generation of many biosensor expressing mice, what we call flat mice. And it is a great success. The expression level of the sensor is even visible under naked eye. And this video is actually taken with my iPhone. So when I joined the lab in 2017, it has been already a time that I can select my partner of red mice from large collection of it, at least more than three. And my answer is, of course, Pikachu, I choose you. And there's a reason for that. I, ha I was hired under the project called Clesto OptoBio, and they supposed me to do application of optical technology for spatial temporal control of biological functions, namely optogenetic study. But I wanted to do something different because I had background in the retinal biochemistry and electrophysiology, so I wanted to study retinal photosensitive mechanism, endogenous mechanism. And I looked up papers and found that cyclic MPPK system is light sensitive in the retina. I will use one slide later to explain this. So my plan is to do this kind of conversation with Pikachu retina, stimulation by light, and here's your answer by optical imaging of the Pikachu biosensor. Now, I'm going to move to the second section of the talk, PK activity imaging data. This video is my favorite data, the G-stack imaging of the Pikachu retina by two photon microscope. But it's not that this is just a fluorescent intensity data, not PK activity data. Pikachu retina was isolated and flat mounted on the culture insert and perfused with flesh and warm DMMF-12 oxygenated medium, like in electrophysiological experiments. And instead of electrode, I put the two photon objective lens and move it downwards with one micrometer interval to, the, to get this series of images. And this is a summary of G-Stack. I got single cell resolution images from surface ganglion cell layer to photoreceptor segments layer. And cell nuclei are shown with black spheres because the biosensor have nuclei exporting signal peptide. And one interesting finding for me is that in this reconstituted longitudinal view of the retina, there are some group of cells in the bottom half that have higher fluorescent intensity than others. And from the position of the nuclei shown by aloheads, it seems to be cones. And that was confirmed by PNA Alexa staining. PNA is a lectin that binds specifically to the extracellular matrix of cones. And staining and high fluorescent cells showed 100% match. Taken together, I established a two photon live imaging method to analyze the PK activity at single cell resolution, including rod cone difference. I will use this feature in the later analysis. And here I'm going to talk about the photosensitive mechanism of the cyclic MPPK system in photoreceptor cell. The left panel is a famous visual photoresponse. Visual pigments in the outer segment of, of rods and cones are activated by light, drive the phototransduction cascade to regulate cyclic GMP to evoke photocurrent in the outer segment. In contrast, the cyclic MPPK system is depending on the dopamine release from gene retina. In this reaction, in addition to visual pigments, melanopsin in the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are involved. Photoactivation in this case leads to the dopamine release from dopaminergic and acne cell in the inner retina. And it is released into intercellular space instead of synapse. So it, dopamine release is diffuses away throughout the retina. And in the photoreceptor, it is received by D4R inhibitory dopamine receptor to reduce the cyclic MP level and suppress PKA. So my plan is to visualize this dopamine-mediated PKA suppression by two-photon imaging. But what I obtained actually is very different from that. This is the PKA activity imaging time-lapse video. PKA activity is shown with this rainbow pseudo color because the actual change from cyan to yellow is very small. So I emphasize the small change with this color. And the light is turned on from minus 10 to zero minute. But 
The change was observed actually after the light is turned off. And it is summarized in this series of images, the same data in different format. And PK suppression was actually obtained at the first plane of light on phase, uh, sorry, but it is it back to the baseline level from the second plane. And the dramatic change was observed after light is turned off. I got sharp and late PK activation. So I changed my plan. Instead of PK suppression, I sought to characterize this potentially interesting PK activation reaction. And the first thing I did is checking light dependency. I did the through the lens stimulation and observed the earlier surrounding the light spot. And this data clearly show that activation is confined in the stimulation spot. So it is light dependent reaction. Second, I identified the cell type affected by light stimulation. This is XZ reconstructed view before and after the light stimulation. And this data clearly shows that only bottom half of the retina is affected by light. And there are some group of cells not activated. And based on previous PNA staining data, it seems to be comfortable receptor. This was further confirmed by high resolution XY image from this PRS layer. And this after light exposure image clearly shows that cons are not activated, lots are activated. And this is uh, statistic stats from extracted PK activity data from Rosa and Kong earlier clearly showing that this is not specific. So these two data indicate light of induced PK activation is not specific. And next, I wanted to know what is the molecular mechanism for it and wanted to identify the responsible photo photoreceptor molecule for it. The first candidate is, of course, rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is expressed in lot after segments at extremely high concentration from three to five millimolar. So it is natural to think it as a first candidate. And I did two analyses. One is spectral sensitivity analysis. I stimulated the Pikachu retina with seven different colors of light from blue light to red light and plotted the efficiency of PK activation as a function of wavelengths and fitted with what is called Kowalowski template to obtain estimated peak at 489 nanometer. That is close to the absorbance maxima of rhodopsin. And involvement of rhodopsin was further confirmed using GNAT1 knockout retina. I, uh, GNAT1 knockout retina was gifted from Vladimir, and I closed it with Pikachu to obtain this mutant Pikachu. And this didn't show light of induced PK activation. So these two data strongly suggest that light of induced PK activation is rhodopsin dependent. Finally, I compared PK activity regulation in two species of Pikachu, pigmented wild type and albino Pikachu. And there's a reason for that. I, when I started my project in 2017, only albino Pikachu was available in the lab because this is suitable for other intravital imaging project in the lab. But I do not want to use that because albino have phenotype in the retina. So I closed the of is normal B6J pigmented white type and obtain the difference between these two species. The first major finding is that rhodopsin level is different. This is rhodopsin absorption data. Rhodopsin is extracted from the retina with detergent and analyzed by spectrophotometer. And I usually do retina dissection under room, quite room light, 200 to 300 lux. And in that condition from white type retina, I can detect constantly detect 17%, about 17% rhodopsin level compared with dark adapted control. But in the case of albino, I wasn't able to detect rhodopsin at all. So it was lucky for me because I can use this albino retina as rhodopsin deficient retina to test my rhodopsin hypothesis further. And this is imaging results. And this is a basal PK activity in the retina. From basal activity, it is really different. In Albina, especially in PRS layer, PK activity is higher than control white type. That's the reason I show the PK activity data in the light panel at a higher position for Albina data. And this is the light stimulation experiment, 10 minute stimulation experiment 
And one thing I found is that light of induced PT activation is absent, and that is consistent with my rhodopsin hypothesis. In the absence of rhodopsin, PK is not activated. And another and the most interesting finding for me is that during the light on phase, PK is suppressed. And that's what I wanted to visualize at the beginning of the project. And this is probably watching the dopamine mediated PK suppression. Here is a summary of the second topic. The main finding is that the Pikachu detected the lot specific light of induced PK activation. It was a great work by Pikachu. And my data also suggests that rhodopsin and transducin is involved in this activation. However, as you know, rhodopsin is not light off sensor, it is light on sensor. So how can the light of induced PK activation happen by rhodopsin? My current model is integration of rhodopsin and dopamine inputs. Previous studies have shown that visual pigments and melanopsin can trigger dopamine release in the retina, and at the photoreceptor level, it suppress PKA. And my finding is that rhodopsin and transducin activate PKA. And if these two inputs are coming together with slightly different kinetics, the combined waveform is, will be like this, and that's what I obtained from white type retina. And maybe albino beta is showing the isolated component of this lower part, dopamine suppression. Now I'm going to the final part of this talk. I think PKA is to boost lot photosensitivity. I want to uh, study the relationship between rot PK activity and rot photosensitivity. For this purpose, I used dopamine perfusion experiment. Dopamine response in the retina itself is very beautiful and interesting because retina have two kinds of dopamine receptors, D4R that can inhibit PKA in photoreceptor cells and D1R that can activate PKA in general retina. So if I increase the dopamine concentration with stepwise manner, I can see two different reactions in the retina. And here is a summarized data, relationship between dopamine concentration and PK activity in two layers of the retina. PRS layers show PK suppression at 10 nanomolar level, and IPL show activation in micromolar level. And that is actually consistent with different affinity of D4R and D1R. D4R is more uh, higher affinity to dopamine. And some people may notice that there's a great activation detected in photoreceptor cell at a very high concentration of the dopamine, 100 micromolar. And this event is actually conspecific. And it's very interesting to the same kind of stimulation dopamine, rows and cones show completely opposite response. But I don't know if this is physiologically relevant and I don't know the mechanism and role of this PK activation. So this is what I want to study in future. Then using 10 micromolar dopamine perfusion experiment, I compared the PK acti activity in rods and cones and PK, no, photosensitivity of rods and cones using XP or ERG techniques. And imaging data show that basal PK activity is significantly higher in rod photoreceptor interestingly, and dopamine suppress both rods and cone PK activity to the lower level. And XVO ERG is what I learned from my postdoc colleague, Franz Bimberg, and I obtained dim flash responses from the retina. A lot of responses are obtained from white type and con responses are from gene one knockout retina. And black lines curve are before dopamine perfusion and red line, red curve is uh, after dopamine perfusion. So this data clearly shows that con responses are not affected by dopamine, but lot of response gets smaller and faster. And my interpretation of this data is that lot somehow have mechanism to keep higher cyclic MP and PK activity, and that boost the lot photosensitivity two times larger. And I think it is related to the history of evolution of photoreceptor subtypes. Molecular phylogeny analysis of visual pigments strongly suggests that cones are prototypical photoreceptor subtypes. So I speculate early vertebrates have cone only retina and can see only in daytime because cones are not sensitive, not enough sensitive for night vision. 
And after morphological changes, emergence of lot specific protein subtypes, modified protein expression level, not are evolved as high sensitive type photoreceptor type, and they got night vision. And I think PK regulation ability is part of this evolution to obtain higher sensitivity. And possible mechanism for the higher sensitivity would be phosphorylation of phototransduction protein, GRK1 and RGS91. And it had been already shown in biochemical in vitro study 20, 30 years ago that phosphorylation of these enzymes modulates the enzymatic activity and direction to increase the photosensitivity. So my future plan is to analyze PK dynamics in many different animal species, including lower vertebrates. They have another interesting, fascinating biological function under the cyclic AMP control. It's morphological change of photoreceptor called retinomotor movement. I think this is very fascinating event, uh, target, of the in, uh, target for the imaging study. Acknowledgement. This study was done in the laboratory led by Dr. Michiki Matsuda in Kyoto University. I got support from people from in Graduate School of Science, Dr. Yamashita Takahiro, Sakai Kazumi, and Michishita Hitoshi from Machine Shop. And I got mouse from Vladimir Kefalov at the time in Washington University in St. Louis. And I got these funding supports. Thank you for listening. <laughs> It was uh, really worth to listen to your wonderful uh, research that you have done. And we're really sorry that you have a sleepless night, but it is a wonderful that, that you have done it for us. So any questions, guys? Dorota? Hi. Um, this was really beautiful work. Um, and um, it is very interesting to see live uh, imaging. Have you ever tried to look at uh, retinal pigmented epithelium, especially in a uh, Albinomized, probably. I don't remember clearly, but I tried RPE imaging, but RPE got burst. Maybe the two photon laser is too strong, and that is, can be absorbed by pigment, melanin pigment, into retinal pigment, epithelium. In so maybe I tested not albino, I tested pigment at the mouse, and I got very. Um, Actually, maybe not induced by light, right? It may be a uh, response to phagocytosis or, for example, the light response, like interaction with photoreceptors. I think it, uh, local temperature uh -huh. increase is the cause of the burst, especially when using pigmented cell. It is a problem in the two photon imaging. Two photon laser excitation is very strong. Might, uh, Shinya, if you allow me, I can comment on that, that uh, this is the problem in eating pigmented animals that melanin is absorbing the two-photon laser. So uh, recently we have implemented the pulse repetition control, which reduces the absorption by melanin. So that might be something you can try if that's of interest to you. Yeah, thank you. Can I have another question? Of course. And uh, Philip. Uh, okay. so, uh, Dorota and Philip, please. So I have a question about retinal ganglion cells. Uh, not all the ganglion cells uh, are expressing melanopsin. Um, so uh, how would you express, explain that you have a signal in almost all retinal ganglion cells? As we... Sorry? Not uh, so only subpopulation of retinal ganglion cells expresses melanopsin. Therefore, yep. it's yep. Uh, uh, responsive to the light, as you uh, explained. Um, so, uh, but the signal we could see in many, in many more, actually all of the retinal ganglion cells. How would you explain it? Is it the dopamine uh, between the cells? I, I don't know. And I'm not sure what do you mean. My imaging is mainly from photoreceptor segments layers and not no, I'm retinal ganglion cell. Thank you. Philip, 
Hi, Shinya. It's Philip Kaiser. A really nice talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, with respect to that last few slides you had where you were wanting to investigate the role of PKA and kind of, um, <clears throat> you know, investigating sort of early vertebrate versus later vertebrate, you know, I, I believe actually lampreys do have rods and cones. Yeah. Both. And, and I think you may have to actually go earlier. You may have to look at a urochordate or a cephalochordate to, I think, really attest that hypothesis. But I think it's a really cool idea. Thank you for your comment. Glad to be here. Eshinia, beautiful presentation. Uh, it's Thank wonderful you. to see you doing so well. Uh, very exciting, very exciting PKA results. Uh, my question is, you suggested that that might be a mechanism for regulating rod functions versus cone function. Do you think that maybe in addition or instead you might think about uh, circadian regulation? I don't know if there, I know there is dopamine obviously circadianly regulated. So could that PKA boost of rod sensitivity be involved instead of uh, circadian regulation of rod function? Yeah, I think so. Um, a lot of the receptor have melanopsin receptor. Though B6 J mouse is not uh, melatonin, melatonin deficient. I think if I do the PK imaging from other species that is melatonin proficient, I can get some circadian rhythm of PK activity, but I have never done that kind of experiment. A lot of work has been done by uh, Dr. Kraft in the past on this uh, aspect. So maybe uh, she will be the most suitable person to make a final comment. Well, you're very kind, uh, Chris. Uh, I thought your presentation was just excellent. And uh, being at 2 a.m., your melatonin peak is probably really high, but the light is inhibiting it. Uh, so <clears throat> looking at the dopamine uh, story and, and melatonin, they've always had that, uh, that uh, diverse yin yang situation so that when dopamine is activated by light, melatonin is low. Um, there's lots of work now done on the dopamine system with the uh, knockout animals. So Mikey Vaughn and, uh, and his group at Emory uh, have done a lot of work looking at that and looking at the photoreceptor transduction of um, you know, light adaptation. So I think you have your work cut out for me, for you. Uh, one question deals with uh, PKA activation in the, uh, the uh, protein called phosdusin, which is also involved. But I think one question I had was, are your albino animals, do they have photo rod photoreceptors left? Uh, and that's why, you know, you have this activation when you first started your project. So because the rhodopsin is, is down, um, are, are there any photoreceptors left in your model? Yeah, in the albino retinas, there's a lot of photoreceptors still. When I extracted rhodopsin from dark adapted albino retina, I can detect rhodopsin 50% to the B6J dark adapted control. So Lotto is still alive, I think. They're still alive, yeah. So I, I think uh, you have beautiful work and uh, we're very fortunate to have you. And uh, we really just look forward to many more exciting projects from your lab. Thank you. Thank you. To see you next Friday, the same time, the same place with Mary Burns in person. Perfect.